Jim's Center. And give me one second, I'll get my script here. I want to welcome you to this, the first in our Portland lectures as part of uh, the OHC's uh, theme for this year of Connections. Uh, our second Portland le lecture, our Criticos lecture, takes place on March, no, on May 14th. And our speaker for that lecture is William Derezowitz. Uh, he's an SAS literary critic, author, and uh, provocateur. His book is called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite and the Way to a Meaningful Life. <laughs> he's a Portlander, too. He's one of your people. Um, I just have a couple of quick announcements before I introduce the speaker for tonight. Uh, as always, we have, as you saw as you came in, an information table about upcoming uh, OHC sponsored and co-sponsored events, our television show UO Today, and you can sign up uh, for our mailing list. We'll have time after the lecture for questions, and because we're live streaming the talk, um, I will bring you a microphone if you want to ask a question, but I'd ask you to come to the aisle so that I can get to you easily. If you can, if not, I can come to you. Um, I also need to give some quick thanks. First, uh, thanks to the fine UO Portland staff here at the White Stag, who always do a terrific job helping to make our Portland lectures successful. I also need to thank the OHC's uh, incredible staff, our associate director, Julia Hayden, our program coordinator, Melissa Gustafson, and our communications coordinator, Peg Gerhardt, and our student assistant, Megan Connor, for all their work helping to make events like this happen. And we could never, without the collaboration and help of our staff and our friends, uh, be able to bring um, world-class leaders in the humanities like our speaker tonight, the esteemed historian and scholar of Jewish studies, Susanna Heschel. Professor Heschel, Heschel will present this year's Tzedek Lecture in the Humanities. The Tzedek Professorship was established by a generous gift from two loyal Portland supporters of the OHC to whom we are deeply grateful. The title of the professorship refers to the Hebrew word for righteousness or justice. The Tzedek Professorship was inspired by the Ethics After the Holocaust Conference held at the U of O in May of 1996 and by the life and work of the Lithuanian French philosopher, religious thinker, and Nazi prisoner of war, uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Levinas made ethical responsibility to others the focus of his philosophy. Given the origin of and inspiration for the Tzedek professorship, the selection of Susanna Heschel as this year's Tzedek professor makes perfect sense. Justice, righteousness, and responsibility to others have always been central to Professor Heschel's life and work as a teacher, a scholar, a feminist, a historian, and a faithful Jew. Susanna Heschel is the Eli Black Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. Her work as a historian has taken her in many directions, including feminist theology, the history of biblical scholarship, Jewish-Christian relations in the 19th century Germany, the history of anti-Semitism, and the history of Jewish scholarship on Islam. Professor Heschel has written, edited, or co-edited numerous publications, including the monographs Abra Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, and the Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany, as well as the edited volumes on being a Jewish feminist, an insider-outsider, American Jews, and multiculturalism. As her wide-ranging and innovative publications make clear, Professor Heschel has always pursued her scholarship with a profound sense of intellectual curiosity, ethical responsibility, and moral courage. Not only is Susanna Heschel an ideal Tzedek professor, but the subject of her talk tonight is an ideal one for a Tzedek lecture. Professor Heschel's father, the revered rabbi, theologian, and civil rights leader, Abraham Joshua Heschel. Professor Heschel will speak with us tonight on moral grandeur and spiritual audacity, the life and legacy of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Please join me in welcoming Susanna Heschel. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you here in Portland. Uh, and I imagine.
imagine you may recognize that picture that's the, uh, how do you call it, the home page of my computer screen. Uh, there must be a better name than that. Um, that's the march in Selma, and some of you may have seen the film Selma that came out recently, yes? I'm just curious, yes? Okay. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's also given me a chance to get to know students and faculty at the University of Oregon and the Humanities Center. And of course, to come to Portland always means a chance to see my aunt, Miriam Strauss, who's here with us from Lake Oswego. So I'm happy, and I thank you, Paul, for inviting me. I thank also Julia and Melissa and Peg for all of your help in organizing everything. And I thank you, David and Nancy, for sponsoring this lectureship. So I've been asked to speak tonight about uh, my father and about, um, and about his legacy and his life. I want to tell you a bit about his life and the things that he accomplished, which were extraordinary, and talk a little bit about what makes him distinctive as a modern Jewish thinker. I've also, yeah, it works, okay. I'm always amazed, it's like a miracle when a computer works, don't you think? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> One of the things that I find very striking is the experience that so many people have when they read my father's work. I receive emails, several emails every week from people I don't know, but who just want to tell me that they've read my father's books, writings, and what they tell me over and over again is that they feel so close to him. They feel an intimacy with him when they read his work. I think that's true for so many of us, and I think also many people feel when they read my father's work, that there's a closeness as if he's talking to them personally, as if he understands them. He's speaking to us in his words. People go back over and over again and read his work, and each time they see something new, they understand something on a deeper level. It's true because my father was someone who was capable of extraordinary intimacy. When you talk to him, he listened so intently and looked at you in a serious way. He always understood me. He always gave me the feeling that he had the feelings I was experiencing in that moment, that he shared them with me. That intimacy is extraordinary. He's inspiring to so many people. His work has been translated into many languages, and I'll just mention a few. Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Czech, Spanish, Portuguese. French, Polish, Croatian, Dutch, German, and now Urdu. Someone wrote to me from Pakistan, a professor of Islamic theology in Islamabad, that he's translating my father into Urdu. And I think that's extraordinary, very special, yeah. I want to tell you something about him as a person also. And the reason is that for my father, when he wrote about the prophets, about the rabbis of the Talmud, about Maimonides, the medieval Jewish philosopher, he always emphasized the importance of trying to understand the subjective, the personal element behind someone's thought. He wrote a biography of Maimonides in 1935, and he really brought Maimonides to life. He tried to explore his inner subjectivity, not just the arguments that Maimonides makes in his writings, but what was he feeling and experiencing, for example, after the death of his beloved brother, how he went into a depression for a year? In so many ways, my father sought the intimacy, the subjective. He also broke with modern Jewish thinkers with that as well. So for example, in the 19th century, German Jewish scholars, and this was the great era of Jew German Jewish thought and history, created Maimonides and Maimonides' God as omnipotent, all-knowing, unmoved. Maimonides was an Aristotelian. My father broke with that tradition. He said, no, if you read a little bit more carefully what Maimonides is telling us is that he too strove for prophetic inspiration. He too wanted to be touched by God. He points out also that Jewish mystics drew from Maimonides, so he couldn't be simply an Aristotelian, very, very cold and unmoved. 
And by the way, since this picture is here on the screen, I'll just tell you that I was struck by some of the theological affinities between my father and Martin Luther King, and I noticed that both of them used a similar phrase. They used to say, the God of the Bible is not the unmoved mover of Aristotle. No, but the most moved mover of the Bible, of the prophets. God is moved, God is touched, God has an inner life. That's what's so important. My father did work on German Jewish thought, philosophy, historiography, but he responded with Jewish sources. And his argument was that there is a chain that leads us from the Bible, the prophets, through rabbinic thought, through the Middle Ages, to Hasidism. Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, didn't come in as an external intrusion into Judaism. It's not derived from Gnosticism or from paganism. It's very Jewish. It's derived from the prophets themselves who spoke about God's responsiveness to us. That was a central theme for my father, what he called divine pathos. And that's very different from what most modern Jewish thinkers write about when they speak of God. For my father, what was important was also, and now I'm going to put this screen on, was the subjective experience. For example, when he writes about Kabbalah, about the Svirot, the 10 emanations of God, he says, these are not just abstract symbols, the way, for example, Yeshayahu Tishbi wrote about them. He says, no, these are describing the inner life of God, God's own emotions and subjectivity. And so he writes, does man stand in a symbolic relation to God? To the outsider, religion may appear as a symbol, just as those who see a man weep. Weeping is a symbol of grief, pain, or fear, a symbol. Hmm? But to the afflicted man, weeping is not a symbol. The attention that my father gave to me, to his students, to members of the family, to his friends, that also forms the basis of his attention to the individual, to the individual. And so, in fact, he could also be very critical. He argued that in rabbinic thought, there's so much attention to the collective. He argued that also in the modern period, we worry about the Jewish community. And he says the sages of Israel have overlooked the man and the Jew, the person, the human being. They gain no insight into his difficulties and fail to understand his dilemmas. Every generation has its own problems. Every person is burdened with anxieties. But the sages remained silent. They did not guide the perplexed and showed no regard for the new problems that arose. That, by the way, is a pretty strong critique. And that's something you don't find in most scholarship, Jewish scholarship on the rabbis. I'll just tell you a story when we come to the next sentence. My father used to sometimes ask his rabbinical students, is gelatin kosher? <laughs> and the students would argue, if gelatin comes from horses' hooves, it's definitely not kosher. But if you make it in a laboratory from chemicals, then would it be kosher? If you make something from chemicals that's equivalent to the hoof of a horse, and the hoof of a horse isn't kosher, is it kosher or not kosher? And the students would argue back and forth with great animation and enthusiasm making this argument. And then he would stop them and he would say, are nuclear weapons kosher? And they would pause and they didn't know how to begin even to discuss or to debate that question. Is it permissible or forbidden? Is it kosher or not? The authors of the halakha and the modern man do not speak the same language. And then I love this, he says, is it a sin to derive joy from Judaism? <laughs> you know, people sometimes ask me, uh, or they use the phrase strictly observant. Was your father strictly observant? I say, no, he was joyously observant. <laughs> so there are my father's writings and there are people, the people he inspired who carry that inspiration and even radiate it. I want to tell you something tonight about my father's spirit because I think the kind of person he was was central to understanding his legacy. It was a kindness and gentleness and compassion. 
that I think also deserve our emulation. I want to emphasize also for you that my father never left behind his Hasidic background. My father was born in 1907 in Warsaw to a Hasidic family. He was the son of a Rebbe and many generations of Hasidic Rebbe, one after another. And they were considered royalty in the Jewish world. And my father, too, was expected to grow up and become a Rebbe. When he entered a room, adults would stand up because he was going to be a Rebbe. When he was a little boy, they would lift him up on a table and he would give learned talks. He was very pious when he, and I want to tell you, you can see how far he came. When he was in Warsaw, he wouldn't walk in front of a church. He would cross the street. When he went to the store to pick up something for his mother and he would buy something and the shopkeeper was a woman, he waited for her to put the change on the counter before he would pick it up so that he wouldn't take something directly from the hand of a woman. It was not pious enough to do that. My father came first briefly to Vilna and then came to Berlin in 1927 to study at the University of Berlin. He came already with smicha, with um, rabbinical ordination, but he wanted to understand how rabbinical uh, seminaries in Germany were teaching. And he went both to the Reform Seminary and also to the Orthodox Seminary. And you have to understand that that just wasn't done. The two seminaries didn't speak to one another. And in fact, they were located on the same street in Berlin, which at the time was called Artillery Street. <laughs> Very fitting. <laughs> but he was open to all aspects of Judaism. So he entered the University of Berlin in 1927. He felt that Berlin at the time was the intellectual and cultural center of the universe. It was vibrant. It was exciting. He went to concerts and lectures and theater. He rented a room from different families in the city of Berlin. He had no money. There were times when he just ate potatoes for the day. That's all he could afford. But he loved being there. He finished his dissertation in December of 1932. In February of 1933, he had the oral defense. And I saw the records from the university. The professors wrote that he seemed nervous. Imagine a Jew in Germany in February 1933 seemed nervous, of course. The university wouldn't give him the PhD because the requirement was that you had to publish the dissertation. And by the way, the only reason he was allowed to take the oral exam was because he was Polish, not German. You understand? He had Polish citizenship. So he had to scramble to find a publisher to publish his dissertation. In Germany, that wasn't possible. Finally, in Poland, the uh, Polish Academy of Arts and Letters published the dissertation. And then he had to convince the university in Berlin to accept this as a legitimate publication. It took almost three years. And the correspondence he had with the dean, the dean would sign his letters, Heil Hitler. And my father tried very hard to get a position somewhere outside Germany. When he first came to Berlin, he thought, you know, the expectation was he would become a professor, hopefully in Berlin or somewhere else in Germany. But he realized he had to get out. In October of 1938, all the Polish Jews living in Germany were arrested and deported. The Poles didn't want to take them in. They were in a no man's land on the border. My father finally got into Warsaw, where his mother was living and, and his sister, two of his sisters. He had a third sister who was in Vienna and a fourth sister who had left with her husband for the United States. The Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, the Reform Rabbinical College, managed to get visas with a great deal of effort, very hard, managed to squeeze out of the US State Department visas for five Jewish scholars. And my father was one of those who was able to come here in March of 1940. He spent the war years there. And then after the war, he moved from Cincinnati to New York and became a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I must tell you that my father always used to say to me, even when I was a child, and you know, children can often be in a lot of pain and sorrow. Friend hurt your feelings, <coughs> for instance. He always told me, never despair. It's forbidden to despair. To despair suggests that you don't sense God's presence. And I have to tell you the fact that at the end of the war, 
Then my father married my mother, who grew up in Cleveland, who was a wonderful concert pianist, that he married her, had a child, that he didn't despair. I find that very impressive. And it was in the years after he married that my father started writing in English. When he came here, he barely knew English. I just must tell you something. He told me that shortly after he arrived in Cincinnati, he went to buy some stamps at the post office. And he bought the stamps, he got the change. He said to the woman at the desk, thank you. And she said to him, you're welcome. And he was so struck by that. You're welcome. My father was very attentive to language, as you can tell from his books. He used to come home at the end of the day and say, today I wrote a good sentence. I have books that he bought when he was learning English, books about English adverbs and English adjectives. He read Shakespeare. He read the King James translation of the Bible. He read a lot of poetry. And his English is extraordinary. What he wrote before he came to America in German, in Yiddish, in Hebrew, still doesn't have the same poetic quality. I think that there is a divine inspiration behind those books in English. The Earth is the Lord's, the Sabbath, Man is Not Alone, Man's Quest for God, God in Search of Man. So many books he wrote in such a short time. It's extraordinary. But you know, in my father's lifetime, he wasn't always well understood. He used to say he felt that Christians understood him better than Jews. And just to give you an example, when I was a little girl, sometimes colleagues of my father's would come over to me, people from the Jewish Theological Seminary, where my father was not treated very well, as you may already know. But they would say to me, you know, your father's work is just poetry. Who talks like that to a child? <laughs> An adult to speak that way to the child about the father? And then I think also, what do you mean, just poetry? <laughs> what, T.S. Eliot? Shakespeare? Those are nice words. Uh, no ideas? Nothing there? No substance? Can you imagine? That was the mentality. It should tell you something. And I must say, uh, whatever the critiques of my father's work, <laughs> I think the derogatory statement that it's just poetry, that's the greatest badge of honor for my father. <laughs> And you know, there really is no one else in Jewish history who's been a scholar of so many different fields and who's been both a scholar and an inspired and inspiring prophetic voice. Why poetry? When I was in fourth grade at Ramaz, which is an Orthodox day school in New York, there was a parent-teacher meeting and my father went to the meeting and the teachers told the parents what they were going to be teaching in the curriculum that year and my father raised his hand and said, can you teach the children poetry? Why do you suppose he meant that? What is prayer if not poetry? So if you want to teach the children prayers. And this brings me to another anecdote that I want to tell you. In 1936 in Germany, my father met Martin Buber. He was very excited. Buber was, of course, older and very distinguished. And Buber invited my father to tea at his home in Heppenheim, outside Frankfurt. My father was delighted. My father at the time was still very young. He was 29 years old. And he went to the tea, and he wrote in a letter to a friend that there was a lively discussion at the table. You know, Buber at the time was the head of an adult Jewish education program in Frankfurt, which, by the way, my father then uh, uh, succeeded Buber when Buber left for Palestine in 1937. But what was the discussion at the table? What to teach adult Jews? And Buber said, we have to teach them the prayer book, the prayers. And my father said, no, we have to teach people how to pray. Not gebet, but beten, how to pray. But what's so striking about my father is the way he shattered all the previous conceptions we had, whether it was about Maimonides, about the Bible, he was always questioning and challenging, and he was never satisfied with a single answer. He would read a book and then say, well, what's wrong with this book or this idea? Let's go to the next step. That's, of course, what an intellectual does. 
He was also He was also someone who persevered despite the fact that he wasn't well treated at the Jewish Theological Seminary. For many years, he wasn't allowed to teach the rabbinical students, for example. His work was often treated with contempt. When he went to Selma, nobody was happy, nobody thanked him, nobody was pleased. A few students went, but not the, not the faculty members. But at the same time, he never despaired. And I think the fact that he wasn't drawn in to the institution where he taught was a good thing because it allowed him to go out into the world. My parents, my parents used to tell me about the time that uh, a review appeared by Reinhold Niebuhr of my father's book, Man is Not Alone. It was in the New York Herald Tribune. It was before I was born. And it was a big review and full of praise and my father and mother were delighted. They were so happy. This was wonderful and it was a Sunday. And they expected their friends to call and say, Mazel tov. And the phone didn't ring all day. And they used to say, don't be an academic. <laughs> it's too mean, too cruel. Yeah, they were right, weren't they? Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, on the other hand, so many people said to my father, you are rabbi to the world. Jews and Catholics said that. Watching my father pray every morning brings me to a different dimension of his life. Sometimes we would be out somewhere on a weekday afternoon, downtown or New York, and it was time to daven mincha before the afternoon prayer, before the sun began to set, and he would step to the side and pray. His devotions were very intense. On Friday evenings, we almost always stayed home. We didn't go to the synagogue Friday night. Fridays were busy days, you know, preparing for the Sabbath, shopping and cooking, getting ready. And the intensity would get stronger and stronger with the hours, and it was especially in the winter when the Sabbath arrives early. And then quickly was time, hurry, to turn off the stove and to turn off the lights and to go into the dining room and kindle the lights. And we would do that, and then we would go into the living room that had big windows facing the Hudson River, facing west, and we would watch the sunset. My parents didn't entertain that often, but when they did, it would be for Shabbat dinner, or more often, on Shabbat afternoon tea. They would invite students from the seminary, and the table in the dining room was open, big table, and they would sit around, and the students would talk about where they came from, what they were studying, and their hopes for the future. We went to the services of the Jewish Theological Seminary, but when my father really wanted to daven on a Shabbat morning, he went to the Gerash Tibel on the Upper West Side, Rabbi Tziviak. And I just want to tell you that after my father died, on Friday afternoons, for years, every Friday afternoon, there would be a knock at the door. And it was Rabbi Tziviak bringing a bottle of wine and challah to my mother and me. And it was really an extraordinary experience. It felt like something out of Shifchei Abesht, out of a Hasidic story. My father often was, as many of you may know, critical of Jewish life. It didn't live up to what it ought to be, he felt. And he would be invited to give lectures, and he would always tell people what they didn't want to hear. My mother would say, can't you tone it down a little, you know, and she would try to get him. But he would come back, they didn't like it. He would tell the reform rabbis, you need more halacha, more Jewish observance. He would tell the conservative rabbis, where is God in your teaching? Where is Agadah, where is theology? And they didn't like it. <laughs> he deplored what he thought was the coldness of the synagogue, these great big edifices that we built. And then people would come in and sit back, and there would be vicarious davening, vicarious prayer. They'd sit back, and the rabbi and the cantor would pray for everybody. And nobody was engaged. Nobody was praying. He criticized the sermons. He said a sermon should be like the prayer, a part of the service. It should be like a prayer. And it shouldn't have platitudes. 
The leaders of our people, this is typical, do not know the language of the soul. A person goes to the synagogue. His mouth is sealed, his mind blocked. Who shall open his heart? Who shall set his soul aright? The soul of every living thing praises thy name. And shall the soul of the Jew not know how to praise? On every Sabbath, multitudes of Jews gather in synagogues, and they depart as they have entered. The soul does not know how to pour itself out. There is a gulf between the soul of the individual and the atmosphere of the synagogue. There are those who have come from afar, from the depths of alienation, with a vague yearning in their hearts. What they sought for was not given them, and what they already had was taken from them. I don't know if you know, if you understand, uh, or if you've experienced, but I can give you an example. Should I give you an example? When my father deplored the vulgarity that sometimes occurs, unfortunately, in some synagogues, I recently went to a synagogue to attend a bat mitzvah. It was a busy synagogue. It was a very full and crowded conservative synagogue, and the rabbi had a wireless microphone, and he was walking up and down on the beam. It was sort of like a game show host it felt like, and things were happening quickly, quickly. The uh, baby naming and an ufruf and a bar mitzvah and a bat mitzvah. Everybody got their three minutes and it's over. And then at one point, ready for the next Torah reading, and they only read maybe two, three verses from the Torah. That's all. Make it quick, quick, quick. And he said, all of a sudden, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel went to Selma to march for voting rights. And when he came back, he said, I felt my legs were praying. And so too the members of our bicycle club who will now come forward for the next aliyah. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> yes, indeed, my father wrote in 1958, being in Galut, in exile, means not only being outside the land of Israel, it's also a spiritual condition. Some bar mitzvah affairs are Galut. Our timidity and hesitance to take a stance on behalf of Negroes are Galut. It is not only that we are in Galut, Galut is in us. And indeed, the bicycle club, that comment, yeah, Galut. And my father felt that way at times in Israel as well, by the way. He was invited to Israel in 1965. And you know, this is 2015. And I must tell you, 50 years ago, amazing things happened in my father's life. My father, in March of 65, marched in Selma. That summer, he spent two months. We, my mother and I, went with him. We went to Israel for two months. My father was invited by President Zalman Shazar to give lectures all over the country uh, because he felt that Israelis were losing a sense of what it is to be Jewish. And then, in October of 65, came Nostre Tate, the church's, the Roman Catholic Church's declaration on the Jews that my father had been instrumental in formulating. And in October, my father formed an organization called Clergy and Laymen Concerned about Vietnam. It was quite a year. So what about Jewish life today? Well, my father writes, the Hasidic zeal is not there. One does not attain the inner essence of the Torah. It's a situation of, and this is a quote from the Bible, the voice, you know this quote, yes, from Isaac. The voice is the voice of Esau, and the hands are the hands of Jacob, but he's turning it around, yes? Physically, we are Jews, but spiritually, a fearful assimilation is raging. Jewish leaders talk about social and political problems with the voice of Esau, when the world is hungry instead to hear a new spiritual word in Jewish terminology. Don't think, by the way, that my father started writing this way only in the 50s or 60s. Already in Germany in 1936, I found an article that he wrote where he said, in German, he said, the German Jews are inverted Moranos. What does that mean? What's a Morano? It's a Jew who converts to Christianity but maintains a Jewish identity. So the Christian on the outside, Jewish on the inside. Inverted Morano in Germany, yeah? They were Jewish on the outside and Christian on the inside. They had lost a sense of what it is to be Jewish. But let me tell you also that my father 
had a certain style of humor always. He was imbued with a humor, a special kind of humor. First of all, I want you to know that my father loved to laugh. He loved Yiddish stories, Yiddish jokes. His friends would come to the dinner table. They were almost all European Jewish refugee scholars. They talked about what happened in Germany. They also told wonderful jokes. My father also mitigated the sharp criticism of his words with irony and humor that moderated its harshness. Irony was a trope that he used all the time. And I want to tell you something about irony. Here's a quote from the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who my father wrote about in his last book, A Passion for Truth. But Kierkegaard writes, the most common form of irony is to say something earnestly that is not meant in earnest. The second form of irony, to say a in jest, something meant in earnest is more rare. So what's an example? Here's a wonderful example. This is from an interview my father gave in television with Carl Stern. He says, if God is so concerned about man, which surprises me, why shouldn't God be more concerned about, let us say, cosmic energy or astronaut techniques? He's interested in widows and orphans in Jerusalem. My Lord. If he were to ask me, I would say, it's beneath your dignity. You, God of the universe, should be concerned about the poor, about the disadvantaged. Yes, he is. Man is very important to God. Irony here points to several levels of earnest absurdity. That God would need human advice. The incongruity between philosophical definitions of God being omnipotent and the Bible. And then there's the hubris of philosophy, that it can save religion, huh, as Kierkegaard writes. Is that not what philosophers are for? To make supernatural things ordinary and trivial. <laughs> but even when critical, my father could also be wonderfully gentle and try to bring us together. So I'll tell you, once in Philadelphia, there were some real estate developers who were Jewish and were, were involved in, uh, in some shady business, let's say, exploitation. And the rabbis in Philadelphia got together and they realized there's a scandal brewing, we have to do something. So they decided to have a meeting. And they would invite these real estate developers to come together for a breakfast with the rabbis and they asked my father to come and speak to them. So my father went to speak to them and what did he say? He didn't come in and scold them for being corrupt, no. He said, you know, I envy you. I envy your profession because you bring together the two things that God created, land and human beings. Yeah, it's a real estate developer. <laughs> Gently, he scolded them and held up another example. My father was passionate, passionate also about race. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the theologian James Cone, C-O-N-E, from Union Theological Seminary, recently published a book called The Lynching Tree. And he pointed out that in my father's first speech about religion and race that he delivered in 1963 in Chicago, he speaks with enormous passion. And James Cone points out that other theologians in America were also opposed to racism, of course, but their language was more often very dry very distant. He points out, for example, Reinhold Niebuhr, great theologian and very close friend of my father's. Reinhold Niebuhr was rather dry when he spoke about racism until he came to know James Baldwin. And then through their friendship, his language became more passionate. And I was struck when I read that because my father had no, of course, no African-American colleagues at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I don't, he had no friends who were black. I don't think he ever read James Baldwin, frankly. He didn't read literature particularly. And yet he was passionate passionate in that speech, and that was, by the way, the time, the day, when my father met Martin Luther King. But I think what informed him also was what my father disliked was laziness, ignorance, shallowness. He said, in the realm of theology, shallowness is treason. So the passion came from that. I want to tell you also how close my father was to our Hasidic family, because I think sometimes people don't realize that when they write about my father. 
My father was expected, as I told you, expected to grow up and become a Hasidic Rebbe. But he said, you know, he felt that the world needed something different from him. To be a Hasidic Rebbe was to be isolated, insulated. And he felt he needed to go out into the world. He felt, he wrote, that Judaism was the least understood religion, the most poorly understood religion. And what he brought to his scholarship and to his theology were Hasidic principles, Hasidic ideas, and a Hasidic sensibility. And when you read his work, sometimes you don't even realize that he's quoting a Hasidic idea. But that's what imbues his work. My father's older sister married their cousin, the Kapitschnitzer Rebbe, who lived in New York. Another cousin was the Bayana Rebbe, another was the Novominsker. My father was very close to them. We visited them, and my father was on the phone with them frequently, with the Kapitschnitzer at least once a week. This, he said, this was, this was his inheritance, and he would point to the Hasidic books on his shelf and say to me, this is your inheritance, this is your Yerusha. What does this mean? Let me just give you one example. So the title of one of my father's books is God in Search of Man. My father called it divine pathos, that God needs us. There is a tzorach gavoha, a divine need that's described in rabbinic literature and that imbues the prophets also, that God responds to human beings, that when we injure someone, we injure God. When we give strength to another person, we give strength to God. What are the words of the Kaddish, Yiskadal v'Yiskadash? Let there be more of God in this world. I came across a text by the person for whom my father is named, an ancestor that goes back seven generations, the Oyev Yisrael, Avram Yeshua Heschel of Ap, Hasidic Rebbe who was in Ukraine. And he says in this text, something really beautiful, very magnificent. He says, you know, we human beings image God in human terms. But in the Bible, we speak of the finger of God, the arm of God. We anthropomorphize. But then he says, how is it from the other side? How does God see us? And you know, think about it for a moment. What does it mean? We anthropomorphize God, but how does God image us as human beings in divine terms? It's impossible for us to talk about it, to think about it, to describe it, because once we do, immediately we're anthropomorphizing again. But it certainly turns, turns the perspective. It makes it very different, you see? And you ask yourself also, what does it mean to think of yourself as an object of divine concern, as my father says? What does it say about human beings? What does it say about our potential? My father was so critical of all the books in anthropology, sociology, and so on, that he felt we're terribly reductionist. That compared human beings to Anna, how are we different from an ape? No. What can we aspire to? Human beings have very few friends left in this world, he wrote. What ideals do we have? What can we become? Vietnam haunted my father. It made him sleepless. It brought him anguish. He wasn't a pacifist, but what was he afraid of was that this war was not something we could win in the way we thought we wanted to win, that instead we were committing war crimes with carpet bombing. My father once went to a demonstration against the war in Vietnam, and a journalist who was very unfriendly I came over to him and said, what are you doing here? And my father said, I'm here because I can't pray. And the journalist said, what do you mean you can't pray, so you go to a demonstration against the war? And my father said, when I open my prayer book, I see before me children burning from napalm. How can I pray? It disturbed him terribly. Prayer isn't something that takes you away from the world. It's not a refuge. 
On the contrary, he said, prayer must never be a citadel for selfish concerns, but rather a place for deepening concern over other people's plight. Prayer is meaningless unless it is subversive. It shouldn't leave you complacent when you leave the synagogue. You don't pat yourself on the back and say, ah, what a good person I am, I went to the synagogue. On the contrary. And I have to tell you, <laughs> too often we do hear platitudes in the synagogue. It's a pity. And yet, while speaking for religiosity, he also warned against rigidity and bigotry. And I love this. He said, frequently faith and the lack of mercy enter a union out of which bigotry is born. Isn't that wonderful, describing bigotry that way? Bigotry, the presumption that my faith, my motivation is pure and holy, while the faith of those who differ in creed, even those in my own community, is impure and unholy. Now in those years, 1965, 66, 67, one of the things that was most striking was that political issues were moral issues in my family. And I must also say they were also not discussed on Shabbat, at the Shabbat table. We didn't talk about the war, and we didn't talk about the Holocaust, and we didn't talk about anti-Semitism. But it was a moral concern. And for a long time, the discussion at the dinner table for a good year was whether it was moral to encourage Martin Luther King to speak out against the war in Vietnam. What would it do to the civil rights movement? Would it alienate the president and the Congress? But it was a moral issue. And Dr. King finally spoke out against the war in April of 1967 under the auspices of clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. My father introduced him that evening. And this is what he said. Has our conscience become a fossil? Is all mercy gone? If mercy, the mother of humility, is still alive as a demand, how can we say yes to our bringing agony to that tormented country? We are here because our own integrity as human beings is decaying in the agony and merciless killing done in our name. In a free society, some are guilty and all are responsible. Now these were also the years when my father was very deeply involved with Christians in talking about Nostra Aetate, the Catholic Declaration on the relationship with the Jewish people. I want to just give you a little taste of what it was like, that discussion in those days. You know, religions sometimes feel like empires, collections of multiple traditions, worried about authority, anxious to expand, and yet protect their boundaries. So the historian Manan Ahmed writes of medieval Arab dynasties, quote, to the center of any empire, the frontier is a site of anxiety, of potential harm, of barbarians who could be marching toward the gate. And I think that some of our theologians sound similar. Erecting fences to protect the infiltration of new ideas, especially if they come from rival empire religions. Or they put up walls to keep out women, or walls to prevent influences of other religions. And they don't like to acknowledge even that certain traditions of our own religion come from another religion. I'm sure everybody knows about the Yortzite candle that you light and burns for 24 hours on the anniversary of the death of someone in your family. Where does it come from in Judaism? Even the most secular Jews have a Yortzite candle. But it comes from the Catholic Church in 13th century Spain. We took it over. It's a nice idea, and it's Jewish, even if it came from Catholics. Hmm? We have permeable boundaries. And my father wrote about this in a book hall, in a, an article in it, which he gave as a speech originally, called No Religion is an Island. No religion is an island. What does it mean, an island? It means we do have open boundaries, for one thing. We're not cut off from one another. And we're not an island because religion has to be involved with the society, and with the politics, and with the moral issues of the day. 
The speech that he gave was delivered when he became the Harry Emerson Fosdick Visiting Professor at Union Theological Seminary, Protestant Seminary in New York. And what's interesting about it is that it's not a speech that talks about anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, it's not a search for theodicy, but rather it says that we have to stand together as Jews and as Christians. We have similar problems, and the way we behave affects one another. If Christians behave badly, it affects Jews and vice versa. He says the Jews have to be grateful to Christians for what they've done for us. They preserved certain texts, for example, that we would have lost otherwise, Philo, Josephus, Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha. What's also interesting is that my father breaks with other modern Jewish thinkers who were obsessed with the figure of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew, Christianity begins with Paul. My father doesn't talk about Jesus or Paul. In fact, he says, why should we talk about this? We'll only disagree. Nothing a Jew says about Jesus will ever satisfy a Christian. Better to talk on a different level, a different level altogether. Let's talk about faith. Let's talk about holiness, about piety. Let's see how we can help one another, because everyone feels at times unable to pray, unable to believe, in despair. How can we help one another? Now, my father was asked to be involved with Nostra Aetate. Can I continue for a few more minutes? Is that all right? Is everybody OK? Yeah? So in <laughs> 1962, my father submitted a memorandum to the American Jewish Committee where he made some suggestions, what would be nice to hear from the Roman Catholic Church. And this was a memorandum that was given to Cardinal Bea, it was the cardinal in charge of this document, Nostra Aetate. So my father made four points, and I think these are very striking. He said that he would hope that the church would reject the charge of deicide, that the Jews killed Christ. That the church would stop missionary activity, that the church would expose Christians to Jewish religious life, and that the church would establish a commission to stop prejudice, a commission that would care for fostering Christian-Jewish relations. Now, some of you may know the history. You may know that the negotiations uh, were quite remarkable. There were different draft documents. And by the way, I just have to tell you, when Pope John XXIII opened the Second Vatican Council, he asked for memoranda from the bishops around the world. The bishops in Europe submitted an 850-page memorandum. From America came 200 or 350 pages. Not one word about Judaism in either of these two memoranda. Very interesting. And yet Nostra Aetate is one of the great accomplishments of the Second Vatican Council. But the cardinals got together in Rome, and you know there were different documents, different drafts of Nostra Aetate, and the second draft spoke about the hope for the eventual conversion of the Jews. When my father heard this, he issued a statement. He said, and I remember this so vividly as a child because I was upset. He said, I would rather go to Auschwitz than give up my faith. This was changed. My father was asked to come to Rome. He met with Pope Paul VI for half an hour. They talked. And my father was told that after he left, Pope Paul took out his pen and crossed out that hope for conversion of the Jews. And that did not appear in the final draft of Nostra Aetate. And in fact, the four points that my father makes in that memorandum, those were absolutely taken up. As a matter of fact, Pope John Paul II used to ask visiting bishops always, and what are you doing about Christian-Jewish relations? It was very much high on the agenda. But there's something else that I want to tell you. Nostra Aetate was a result of many intellectual changes that took place in the theologies of Christians. There's a wonderful book by John Connolly that describes some of this. But there's another element, and that's the personal element. In those days, in the early 1960s, it was very uncommon, actually, for Christians to visit a Jewish home for a Shabbat meal or for a Passover Seder. Really, was rare. But my father had friends, theologians, colleagues, priests, nuns, and he would sometimes invite them to our home. And I remember those occasions. I remember how it felt. I remember their faces. 
And what I want to tell you is this. When I look back and I think about those moments in the atmosphere, I remember they would come to our home on Friday evening for Shabbat dinner, and they had a sense of awe when they came in. I think that for them, for these priests and nuns, the experience of coming to a religious Jewish home for Shabbat dinner was like a pilgrimage experience, a religious pilgrimage, as if they were on a pilgrimage to the womb of their own religion. And my father would say the prayers, and I think that they were a little bit taken aback in thinking to themselves, it can't be that this person will not be admitted to heaven. On the contrary, they themselves confronted you know, their own doctrines and questioned them. And they realized that they, as Christians, had something to learn about God from a Jew. And that hadn't happened for 2,000 years. My father never argued, discussed questions of antisemitism. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. He was simply said the prayers, and they had the thoughts in their own mind. I wanted to just say one word about how different my father was in his thinking. There are many different ways I can describe that. But let me just say that in the days when he was first a student at the University of Berlin and later, the field of biblical studies uh, was, how shall I say, not very sympathetic to the Hebrew Bible. In the early decades of the 20th century in Germany, there was the rise of Oriental studies, of the history of religion schools, of course, the social sciences, sociology, psychology, my father felt, by the way, that we shouldn't translate religion into the categories of sociology and psychology, but try to understand religion on its own terms. What is religion to a religious person? Which, by the way, Feuerbach, the later Feuerbach, also said, if you want to understand religion, ask a religious person. Understand what it's like. So in those days, there was an interest in prophecy as a phenomenon, prophecy of the Hebrew Bible or Muhammad as prophet. But what did they say, these German scholars? They described this way, and this is a quote from Gustav Hölscher from the University of, of Heidelberg. He said that the prophets were participating in orgiastic vegetation cults. They practiced a mimetic dance. They were imitating the activity of the god and thus magically supporting it. What was, what was it to be a prophet? It was to be in a state of ecstasy to lose consciousness, or maybe to be an epileptic, they used to say. The prophets were epileptics. Muhammad was an epileptic, and so on. My father rejected those categories completely. He said prophecy is definitely not the same as ecstasy. The prophet doesn't lose his personality. The message is coherent. There is no loss of consciousness, but rather, rather it's God's word is passed through the prophet's consciousness, the prophetic sympathy the identification of the prophet with the pathos of God. And so he asks here, what manner of man is the prophet? The prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul, and he is bowed and stunned in man's fierce greed. Frightful is the agony of man. No human voice can convey its full terror. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice to the plundered poor, to the profaned riches of the world. It is a form of living, a crossing point of God and man. God is raging in the prophet's words. Now, I want you to also know that my father emphasized authenticity. In the last years of his life, he wrote a book about a Hasidic Rebbe called the Kotzka Rebbe. The Kotzka Rebbe said, you can't be Jewish the way somebody else is Jewish. You can't wear somebody else's shoes. You can't have somebody else's Jewishness, he said. He made that, by the way, about the shoes. 
I didn't. No. How do you make your Judaism authentic to who you are? You have to know who you are, first of all. And my father reflects this here in this quotation from one of his books. But I want to also point out to you that the Kotzke Rebbe was somebody who spoke out very strongly against mendacity, against deception. And deception to him meant also don't deceive yourself. Don't pretend to be someone you're not. Know who you are and be who you are. Don't pretend you're somebody else. And so too with Judaism. And so what does this mean? A vibrant society does not dwell in the shadows of old ideas and viewpoints in the realm of the spirit. Only a pioneer can be a true heir. The wages of spiritual plagiarism are the loss of integrity. Self-aggrandizement is self-betrayal. Authentic faith is more than an echo of a tradition. It is a creative situation, an event. So what does this mean? Don't try to be Jewish the way your grandparents were Jewish. That is spiritual plagiarism. I love that phrase, spiritual plagiarism. You don't have to be Jewish like your grandparents. I want to conclude with two final points. First, I want to tell you something about being my father's daughter, and then I'm going to just play you very briefly a little bit of my father's voice. People often ask me, what's it like to be the daughter of Abraham Heschel? Or they have said to me recently, well, how do you find your own voice? As if somehow you break from your parents? I don't feel that way. I actually love everything my father wrote. I admire everything he did. I respect what he did. And I love the kind of person that he was. And I miss him. And I have to also say that I am, of course, his daughter and not a son. And as such, I stand outside the much vaunted father-son relationship that runs throughout not only Jewish but most of Western and Eastern cultures. And at times I face a strong mythic apparatus uncomfortable with daughters and the discomfort that some of my father's students and self-proclaimed disciples feel about the intimacy of my knowledge of my father. We're well aware of that tradition. You know, women are known in the penetrating knowledge of men but do not always have the chance to articulate their own self-knowledge and have for too long not been viewed as sources of authority, inspiration, interpretation. The love between daughter and father receives very little voice in Western thought. There is a void, a silence that disturbs me. It's not only our Jewish tradition. Shakespeare recognizes that void when King Lear demands expression of his daughter's love, Cordelia, overflowing with love for her father, responds, nothing, my lord. So where is the voice of the daughter's love? My father begot me, but I feel I beget him in the retelling of his fatherhood. I am a daughter, not a son and I seek no Oedipal revenge against his patrimony, nor am I beset by an anxiety of influence. I think rather in different images. If the moment of revelation at Sinai is understood in Jewish tradition, drawing from the Song of Songs, as a kiss from God, the Shekhenim and Shekot Pihu, a kiss from God to each soul, as we're taught, that means the Torah comes as intimacy, flesh turned to word, my father's fatherhood into my words of love for him. My father's spirit feels very much alive in those who feel the intimacy of his words, the gentleness of his spirit, his compassion, his courage, his voice. I sometimes wonder and marvel at the remarkable influence he's exerted throughout the world and I wish he could be here to know that pleasure. At times I also imagine, to borrow a phrase from Maud Elman, that he has not died, but has rather gone into diaspora from his body. 
alive still, circulating as a voice among us, inspiring us not to imitation, that would be spiritual plagiarism, as he would say, but to remind us of the extraordinary religious nobility a human being can achieve. He was most definitely new, fresh, vibrant, and never stale. And so as we remember him, let us also keep his memory as a blessing. And in his empathy and enthusiasm for life, and in the seriousness and depth of his moral commitments, also as our challenge. In 1963, a few months after my father first met Martin Luther King, he brought Dr. King to speak at a convention of Jews. They spoke about racism. They spoke about faith. They spoke about saving the Jews from the Soviet Union. And at the end of the speech, my father said a few words that I'll play for you now. He said a few words in Yiddish. And you notice that he speaks there as the we, we Jews and Christians. He has something to say here about the Shoah, the Holocaust, and it's now the 70th anniversary this week of the liberation of Auschwitz. Although he doesn't use the word Holocaust, Shoah, he speaks, as he always did, elusively, but he makes a very important and very moving point. I would like to spend the next three minutes by saying to you just a few words in Yiddish in honor of the Russian Jews most of whom still speak Yiddish. I'd like to say something about our inner situation in relation to what happened in our times in the early 40s. Mir fielen noch aus dem setzeren Kopf, es ducht sich aus der Himmel über uns zu falten Sticker. Mir haben noch aus die Teufels gewesen, dem Bruch und das Unglück, was hat uns getroffen. Wir sind noch alt wie Pfarr de la Weihe, noch nicht gerät sich setzen Schiffe, zu tummeln, zu brochen, zu mischten verstehen. Oft dachte ich mir, als wir alle leben in Neula Matoyu, wir brauchen unsere Sümche, aber es ist wie ein Hassen auf der Säule, ungelumpert, grotesk ist unser Nache, wie Eulam Hasedeke Hanois. Verbrennt ist gewonnen unser Volk. In die Welt bleibt der Welt. Der Asch von menschlichen Beine gibt nicht von sich kein Reier. Der aber von der Welt ist nicht versammt. Unser Bräut ist frisch, unser Zucker süß. Das Geschrei von Millionen in Krematorius hat sich kein und nicht getrogen auf der Qualle von Radio. Scha, still, es ist gar nicht geschehen. Legt noch in unser Herz, ist das Herz geworden stehen. Oft sitze ich und tracht, öfter sind unsere Nischones verbrennt geworden, zusammen mit Seri Gufem in Maidanek und in Auschwitz. Mischuge gottlos ist unsere Welt, in mir jeden tanzen herum, der Nägel so. Wir vergessen, dass wir leben in der Treffen der Welt, finster ist unsere Kufe. In mir sind na viele nicht tun, die Schabe ist dicke Licht. Sechs Millionen Jeden sind in der Weg mit dem Reuf. Blut schweigt nicht, aber unser Gewissen ist stumm wie eine Wand. Verschickert, vertummelt sind in mir mit den Stüssen von der Welt. Sei die Gedeutschen darf nicht unser Kaddisch, aber Efscher darf mir so ein Kaddisch nach uns. Für uns, weil wir haben Mäfscher verloren, bin ich schon aus. Ich will sich nicht einmal rüberreden von Herzen. Mit so einem Kind ist, weil wir nicht heute zu sein. In so einer Frage ist nicht so, dass sie schlagen Kopf in Wand. In so einer Frage ist sie gefunden in einem Impfer. Ein Impfer auf eine gehörige Frage. Was ist der Heu von dem Itzbecken da? What is the task? Not to forget. Never to be indifferent to other people suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, uh, <laughs> um, I think my father was, um, um, first of all, he encouraged me to, when I was sitting around talking about what should I be when I grow up, and he said, why don't you go to rabbinical school? And I said, no, there are no women rabbis. I'll never accept women. And he said, I think they will. Times are changing. And he encouraged me. The one thing he always said, though, when I was a child, after dinner, we would go into the living room sometimes, and my mother would play the piano. Or sometimes we would sit there, my parents would, uh, we, we would play school, and I was the teacher. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes he would say to me, Susie, give a lecture. So I think he thought of me as somebody who encouraged me to be a teacher, and I appreciate that encouragement from him. I didn't become a rabbi, uh, and they did start taking women, but by then I was already ensconced in graduate school. But I'm very happy with what I do, and I think he would have been happy too. What's the name? What's your son's name? He wanted so much to take uh, a class. Didn't with take a class with me. Oh. <laughs> So let me just say, first of all, that I love my students at Dartmouth. I'm sorry your son wasn't in my class, uh, but I always have a good, a good experience with my students, a lot of fun. And I'm always sad when the semester ends and I have to say goodbye to them. And of course, we stay in touch. Every now and then, I, I get an email from a former student. It makes me so happy. Um, and by the way, Dartmouth was the first college in America to invite my father to lecture. <laughs> Uh, about Israel, uh, my father um, wrote a beautiful book about Israel, Israel and Echo of Eternity, about the meaning of Israel for the Jewish people. Uh, after the war in 67, he wrote that book. Um, I think he uh, uh, felt at the time that Israel was bringing something very positive to the West Bank, to Gaza, uh, and that Jews and, and Arabs, Jews and Palestinians could live together in peace and harmony in a wonderful way. And that certainly uh, Palestinians were welcome to come into Israel, a Jewish state, and join with everyone. And that, is, and that Israel would, of course, respect Christian holy sites as well as Muslim and Jewish ones. Uh, he said in his book, we do not worship the soil. It's not about the land, but about the meaning of this place, the biblical meaning, the Jewish meaning that we've longed for for a long time. My father wasn't involved. As in, in political Zionism, he was um, uh, involved in religious thought and religious Zionism. Of course, there are problems with every Israeli government, with every government in the whole world. I think sometimes, uh, as we talked yesterday at the University of Oregon, I ask myself, why is it that the raging debate among professors today concerns Israel? Look what's going on in China and Russia and Myanmar and Yemen and so many other places. There it has a kind of obsessive quality that worries me.
But I think my father would have welcomed any group, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, any group that sought to make peace in Israel, he would definitely be grateful and seek that. So. Well, that's a big question that you've just asked. <laughs> I teach a whole term about that, yeah. But um, let me just say, and I don't know about the Catholic thought that you're referring to, so I can't comment on that, but I'll just say something about Kabbalah. You know, um, in when, when the field of Jewish history and modern Jewish thought arose in the 19th century in Germany, it was um, a very strong bias against the mystical. Uh, Kabbalah was seen as some foreign, um, a foreign intrusion. Apocalypticism also, as a, to quote Heinrich Gratz, a parasitic growth on the healthy body of Judaism. And so too, when Jews started studying Islam, they also ignored Shiism and Sufism. They didn't want to see that. So they tried to create a kind of um, Judaism and an image of Islam also stripped of anything mystical, you know, passionate. They were worried about the passionate. And it's odd to us, but that's how scholars wrote about it as well, Jewish scholars. And my father broke with that tradition and emphasized that uh, the central teaching of Kabbalah is that God needs us and that God is affected by us. So for example, when other Jewish historians and thinkers talk about the divine presence, that is the Shekhinah, so there is an idea. It's called the imminence of God. My father said it's not just an idea, it's a relationship. When we speak about the divine imminence, that God is within, among us, we're talking about a relationship with God, our need for God, but even more, God's need of us. So that's how he understood, and that's what he emphasized. And in that sense, he was very different from the way other scholars at the time were writing about Kabbalah, including Gershom Sholem, for example. My father showed that Kabbalistic ideas, mystical ideas, are not foreign. They're integral to Jewish thought. So it wasn't some foreign thing. It's part of us. Yeah? It's not a subversive trend within Judaism, but an integral part. a lot of it, particularly the book, The Prophets, because it was so important to Martin Luther King. I felt um, that in some sense, th the marginalization of your father's work and the sort of spiritual tradition, I in the end meant that the whole meaning of the civil rights movement was in some sense lost uh, as a moral revolution or the aspiration to that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering just what your thoughts would be about that, because this was sort of a view I came to <laughs> of, uh, as someone who participated in it, and feeling that, that there was th that it was not just a set of legal transformations; it was really an attempt to sort of speak to the soul. Uh, so I just wonder if you would comment on that. 
I fully agree with you. And I think Selma was a great religious experience and a moral moment when America stood up and said, we want to be moral people. We want to do what's right. My father came back from Selma, from the march in Selma, and he said in his diary that Dr. King had told him that this was the greatest day of his life. My father said it reminded him of walking with Hasidic Rebbe's in Europe. And he said, I felt my legs were praying. It felt like prayer. And I think in America there was that sense that this was a great moral moment. And so uh, I, I am, I'm sorry that that's not always captured in what's depicted of the civil rights movement. In the film Selma, there's a scene in Selma where they go to the home of Dr. and Mrs. Jackson. Dr. Jackson was a dentist in Selma and a prominent figure in the African American community. And the scene in the movie shows them in the kitchen and Mrs. Jackson is cooking and they're joking, will she be able to make enough food that everybody wants to eat so much, et cetera. But I visited the Jacksons and Mrs. Jackson, my husband I visited in the year 2005, and she told us that in the morning of the Selma March, there in her living room was a priest and a Catholic priest, an Orthodox priest, Dr. King, ministers, and my father, and each one was praying quietly their own prayers, all in one room. That was a great moment, she described. And that would have been great to show in the film instead of the kitchen scene. First, I want to thank you. First, I want to thank you very much for being here. It has a lot of meaning for me. Uh, my father was born in Warsaw about four years after your father was oh. born there. And uh, my first adult discussion with my father about religion, uh, I was talking about how God is both imminent and transcendent at the same time. Yeah. And my father said, that's not a Jewish idea. Yes, it is. I said, yes, it is. Uh, and, and I said, King David wrote something about that. Uh, haven't you read that part of the Bible? Uh, <laughs> and next thing I know, my father sent me a copy of one of your father's books. Oh, and it has had a lot of meaning for me. I'm flushing here. Uh, and my, my siblings were never really that interested in learning about the essence of Judaism. I, I think of them as matzo ball Jews. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I, uh, when, uh, when I was visiting my father once, uh, uh, he woke up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and here it was, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he sees me sitting on the floor in front of his, his, um, uh, his uh, bookcase. He says, what are you doing? I said, uh, I, I'm reading. He says, what does it look like? He says, what are you reading? I said, about Judaism. He says, you're interested in Judaism? I said, yeah. Do you have any books on Jewish mysticism? And uh, he says, you're interested in Judaism? I said, Jewish mysticism. You're interested in Judaism? And... Uh, two weeks after I left and came back to Portland, uh, uh, he he sent me two big book, the big boxes filled with Jewish books. Great. And what I wanted to ask you is this question of God being both transcendent and imminent. What what which of your father's writings would you say touches this best? Uh, what books or uh, something I could I could read more? Yeah. So I would say that in his book, Torah and Shemayim, which is it's three volumes in Hebrew, but it's translated as one volume in English under the title, it's called Heavenly Torah. It was not my choice of title. It reminds me of Chock Full of Nuts. <laughs> Remember that? The heavenly coffee, right. In me, really, Torah and Shemayim is revelation, tour from heaven. So in there, that's where you'll find that. And the question, you know, you could ask as a theologian, what is it to make the imminent transcendent, the transcendent imminent? That is, our human value should be transcendent. And what is transcendent, that is, divine principles should be made imminent, part of our society. Yeah? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I have found your work on Jesus and the Jewish Jesus to be so powerful. Uh, and hearing you speak about your father's um, work with Christians made me wonder whether you felt some sort of connection 
um, between his work and your own writing and thought? Uh, and if so, if you could speak about that a bit. Uh huh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. First of all, I wrote so I wrote a book about Abraham Geiger, who was a brilliant and original histor Jewish historian in Germany in the 19th century, and he's somebody that I had I'd heard about in my childhood already because in when I was growing up, my my father and his friends were always talking about German scholars, German philosophers, and writers, and yeah, I mean, it was Goethe, Schiller, Thomas Mann, and so on. We didn't know much about. We didn't hear much, we didn't talk much about American writers, those German Jewish refugee scholars. I don't think they ever read Hawthorne or uh, <laughs> what a book about a whale, just like America, you know, they would write about a whale. You know, how can you compare Melville and you know, Rilke, everybody, Rilke, it was always the question, are you for Rilke or are you for Stefan Georga? At any rate, I knew about I knew about Geiger from the time I was a child, but nobody really talked about, nobody knew much about him, no one ever wrote about him. So I think in that sense my father gave me um, that start, uh, and I was fascinated when I came to read Geiger scholarship and saw the originality of his mind. Uh, how does it relate to my father? Um, they're very different, of course, two very different kinds of thinkers. I have a feeling, um, though, that their personalities were similar. They were both very optimistic, and they both cared deeply about the Jewish people. They also felt things have to change in Jewish life. Geiger was one of the leaders of liberal Judaism in his day. They also talked about the complexities of rabbinic thought. You know, if you read a book, for example, Ephraim Urbach's book, Chazal, which is a study of rabbinic thought, what does he tell you? He tells you Plato said great things, but you know what? The rabbis also said it. There has an apologetic quality to it. Yeah. My father wrote about the rabbis. First of all, he doesn't try to reduce it to one agreed upon principle. This is what the rabbis said about God, <laughs> period. No, on the contrary. He's complicated. He says the rabbis said this and they said that. There are different opinions, different schools of thought, different ways of thinking. Some emphasize imminence, others emphasize transcendence, different ways of understanding revelation. So, and Geiger too, when he wrote about Second Temple period, he saw clashes, different tendencies. He wasn't trying to unify things. And so uh, in that sense, that helped me understand. On the other hand, Geiger was the one who said Jesus was Jewish, and Paul invented Christianity. My father didn't talk like that. So I think my father's approach was much different. And in a way, actually, I could say the Christian theologians didn't like Geiger. They didn't like the yeah, what he said, that Jesus is Jewish and said everything that other rabbis said and nothing new, nothing original. They didn't like that. I can understand that. Maybe if Geiger had talked about Christianity when my father did, things might have been a little uh, less tense between Jewish and Christian theologians in Germany in the 19th and 20th centuries. It's a possibility. Hello. Um, I was really taken by uh, your father's words about spiritual plagiarism and also how you had a particular affinity towards those words in particular. I am 18 years old. I'm exploring my Jewish identity. So I was curious if you could speak a little bit about how your particular uh, religious and spiritual practice differs from that of your father's. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> 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 well, let's see. So first of all, you know, I tell my children, you have to feel guilty. <laughs> it's very important because I grew up feeling guilty and, you know, and I want them to know. I want them to know when they sin. That they shouldn't do this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I feel very, I do feel very, very um, upset that I'm not as observant as the way I was when I was growing up as a child. On the other hand, and I, I, it's terrible. I do certain things that I shouldn't do. <laughs> and I tell the children, too, at least feel guilty about it. I feel guilty. Um, <laughs> but yes, I want them also to feel we have a joyous Jewish observance. Uh, and that's important to me. And I also feel that my father opened doors he, everything Jewish, nothing is alien. 
feel comfortable, and I want my children to feel the way I do, comfortable in an Orthodox synagogue and conservative and Reconstructionist and Reformed in the workman's circle, everywhere. I'm, I, and I tell my students, by the way, I have right-wing friends, I have left-wing friends, I hear everything, everybody has a good point to make, I agree, I disagree with all sides, and that's how it is. My father felt at home, and he was also critical of everything. So there was a kind of openness and love of everything Jewish that he transmitted to me and that I hope to transmit to my children. And I also think, by the way, and I felt this from him, you change in your life. People change. You change your interests. You change your emotions. And if Judaism is going to be authentic, it's not only a one, you're not defined in one way for the whole life. The way you are at 18 may not be how you are at 30 or at 50. As it happens, I grew up Orthodox, and I married a man who grew up Reform. We have to compromise, but you know what? He's a tzaddik. He's a saint, my husband, and I'm grateful. I'm honored to be married to him. So if I have to make certain compromises, it's okay. So I hope that you'll be open also to different Jewish expressions in your life. Thank you for coming and sharing. I was very, very touched with your closing and what's happened to our soul and uh, what is our generation's obligation, what is the task. My work is in uh, sustainability, ecological integrity. I work a lot with Native Americans and I, I really feel like this, these words are so applicable to what have we done to the earth and what has colonization wrought everywhere. And I just wondered if you would share a little bit about your feelings about the application of your father's teachings and your own beliefs to uh, the uh, sustainability issues that we have today. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, actually I'll, I'll just tell you that um, unlike many other Jewish thinkers, my father says that there are different paths to an awareness of God. Of course there's Torah, but there's also nature. And he emphasizes that. And he says, if you want to know God, sharpen your sense of the human. And one of the things that he does in his work is to talk about dimensions of human experience that are sometimes unconventional. So what is it to experience a sense of wonder, a sense of awe, radical amazement? And some of this, he says, can come to us through nature, a sense of God's presence, that you have to cultivate the ability to sense God's presence. And that's what's important for us to do. So he doesn't start his work with proofs for the existence of God, for example, like other philosophers of religion, but rather he starts with human beings, and what it is to be a person. I know, of course, he would have supported, had he lived longer, the environmental movement, without question. And it's implicit in his work. And there is, in fact, an Abraham Heschel Center for the Environment in Israel. It's a name for my father because he's the Jewish theologian <coughs> who speaks most directly to environmental concerns, without question. When we would walk, and we'd be coming home, for example, after going to the grocery store, and we would turn off Broadway toward Riverside, and we would see the sunset, he always noticed that. He used to say to his audience when he lectured, did anyone see the miracle that just occurred? <laughs> the sun has set. So I think he actually gives us some wonderful resources for environmental concern, Jewish resources. Uh, I just recently saw the movie Selma, um, and while it was a movie that did have a lot of merit, um, I know that I was upset to not see any sort of depiction of your father, especially in the very iconic picture of um, them all marching together, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. I uh, actually, thank you. I, I wrote a, a little essay about it. Um, I, was, I, I was disappointed that... Um, 
so many rabbis took part. Somebody uh, emailed me and told me that he had counted 26 rabbis who were there, and of course many Jews. Not all of the Jews who participated in the civil rights movement, including those who gave their lives, uh, felt that they were doing so as religious people uh, necessarily. And my father wrote that he was sorry that Jewish organizations hadn't articulated the religious meaning, the religious significance of the civil rights movement in Jewish terms, in terms of the Bible and the prophets. So uh, I think that this was, though, not only um, a Jewish concern, was really, as we said before, it was a moral moment and a religious experience for so many people. And think about how American this was. My father came from Nazi Germany where Protestant theologians were saying that the Old Testament was a Jewish book. It should be thrown out of the Christian Bible. They were supporting Hitler, a whole bunch of them. I wrote a book about this. And they said Jesus wasn't Jewish. He was an Aryan. And they de-Judaized Christianity. They revised the Gospels to take out Jesus going to the synagogue or the genealogy of Jesus from the Old Testament. They had a real problem with Paul, by the way. They had a hymnal that was purged of Hebrew words like hallelujah. And they wrote anti-Semitic propaganda. They said Hitler was doing what Jesus had started. So um, I can't imagine the civil rights movement having the same kind of impact, first of all, in Germany. And then I think, well, what did it, imagine what it meant to my father to come from that kind of Germany to the United States. Now, first of all, he didn't turn his back on Christian theologians, and that's impressive, because I've heard, by the way, some Jews say, I, I look at a cross and I see a swastika. There are Jews who think that way, but my father didn't. And I think he was also amazed that Martin Luther King made the exodus the central motif of the civil rights movement, and that he quoted from the prophets, not from the gospels. And in fact, if you look at Dr. King's major speeches that everyone talks about, the speech against the war in Vietnam, the speech um, at the Washington March in, in August of 1963, or the speech the night before he died, yeah, I've been to the mountaintop and so on. I have a dream. He doesn't quote Jesus. You don't see the word Jesus in those speeches, but you hear the prophets. And that's why at the, at the memorial, the King Memorial in Atlanta, you see quotes, a quote from Prophet Amos inscribed, not from the Beatitudes, let's say. So that's very striking. And I was sorry that in the film Selma, that the only verse alluded to was a verse from Matthew and you didn't hear the prophets. But I'm sorry also that they were unable, for whatever reason, to use the actual words of Dr. King, which was so powerful. But imagine what it meant to my father to hear Dr. King. I can tell you what it meant to me after going, I'm <laughs> after going to an Orthodox day school. I was not exactly in love with the Bible. But I heard <laughs> Dr. King saved the Bible for me. He made me fall in love with the Bible. And that was extraordinary for all of us, and I would like to see that remembered in the United States. That was extraordinary. You know, Dr. King was a great man. I heard him speak in person several times and met him, and I was always inspired. I had tears in my eyes when I heard him speak. He was extraordinary. I've heard people say, well, that this film wants to humanize him. So it opens with the problem with his tying the necktie and so on. Why do we want to humanize, to reduce? I don't understand. Let's explore his greatness. What does it mean to be a great person? Of course, there were many people involved in the civil rights movement, not just Dr. King and Mrs. King, who was a wonderful person. But what about this great human being? Let's explore what that means, and let's, let's honor him and honor ourselves by remembering he was a great man, and this was a great moment for America a religious moment, and a moral moment. Let's remember that. Thank you. Thank you.